Nutz and Studio MMA here with uh, the legend Frank, uh, Frank Trigg. Uh, I had the pleasure of being down with Frank down in Israel for his last fight against uh, Roy Neiman. Mm -hmm. Where you uh, were nice enough to break the guy's jaw in two places. <laughs> How'd you feel? <laughs> I felt pretty good about that. I mean, <laughs> I don't hit really that hard, so he had a weak jaw. No, it was, uh, it was good. It was good. It was um, first time in Israel. Um, it was a good event. It was uh, nice to be back, kind of a more comfortable weight. You know, um, I'm back at 85, 185 pounds, as opposed to 170, and that fight was 180 pounds, so it's kind of that middle zone, trying to get my body put together uh, to be able to compete at that weight. And so it was, it was good. It was good, to, and especially the battle of guy in his home home territory with the home crowd, trying to make that happen. So it was pretty cool. Yeah, it was nice. It was a pretty amazing event with uh, about 20,000 people. First big MMA event in, in Israel. Some of the top names in the game. And uh, uh, yeah, Frank says he doesn't hit hard. We just got done sparring here, actually. Frank hits hard. I don't care what he says. Uh, and <laughs> for you to think that Frank's uh, career is over, it's actually not. You've got a fight coming up pretty soon, right? Yeah, we um, we worked on it for a couple of months. We finally got this uh, this thing signed over in, uh, in London. Um, the, the stuff that goes on behind the camera that you don't know what goes on, it's, it's the funniest part of the whole deal. I just had some guy walk down the hallway, expose his chest to me and start pinching his nipples as I'm on camera. That's what he just did to me. Um, and try to keep a straight face while this whole thing's going off is pretty, it's pretty amazing. Um, Friday, May 21st in uh, London uh, for BAMA, which is British Association of Mixed Martial Arts. Uh, it's, um, uh, they've been around for six shows or seven shows now. Pretty good. It's where Paul Daly that's where Paul Daly got his uh, his start. So it's actually a pretty pretty neat uh, um, experience to have England, you know, want to have me come over and, and compete. Um, it took, like I said, it took a while to get to finally get the thing signed, but it got together, and then um, we're fighting. Uh, uh, what's up, Neil? <laughs> My grappling coach, Neil. Yeah, it's, he's a complete tool. Don't worry about him. He is the one, by the way, behind the uh, behind the camera right here, uh, rubbing his nipples. It's just so you're getting, you know, you're getting exposed right now, mate. <laughs> uh, you find a guy who's uh, he's got he's got decent punching power for sure, oh, right? God, yeah, he's like he's thirty. 13 and 3. John Phillips, he's 13 and 3. Um, I think he's had 12 TKOs out of out of 13 wins. And he's lost one by, he got knocked out one time, he got submitted once, and, he had, and lost the decision once. That's his three losses. So he's lost every way he can possibly lose, and then he's pretty much knocked everybody out that he beat. So it's, it's a question of how is this really going to go on. I think his one his one loss or decision is to the champ of Bama, which was to Tom, Tom Kong Watson. And it was a back and forth battle for five rounds, and he was still in the game the entire time. Thomas couldn't finish him. And then, uh, and then uh, John Phillips just almost caught him at the end with, uh, with a big, big haymaker left, and, and it didn't put him down, but it went to, the, went to the cards, and the judges went for in Tom's favor. But this is a pretty tough bout for me because, you know, the last t two times I fought in the UFC against Kashuk and Sarah, I got knocked out both times. So this was like a question of, was it because I had injuries that got knocked out, and I just wasn't? Was it because I didn't have the right training camp? Even though I was at Extreme Couture's, I wasn't using the right guys at Extreme Couture's to prepare for my fight. You know, what's is it? Too, am I, is it really that I'm too old? Is it really that it's the wrong weight class? Like, what was the reasons for that kind of stuff? So I said, well, you know what? Let's you know, I, I beat, I fought a grappler in Roy Neiman. I beat him up with my hands. So now I'm going to fight a guy that has great hands. There's no way I can beat him up with my hands. It's not possible. I don't have the skill to beat him up with my hands. So I have to use my wrestling and my grappling skill to beat him up. So let's find out if I can still do it. If we get knocked out, we're going to have a different conversation coming home, that's for sure. You know, it's going to be a whole whole different kind of concept. But we definitely know we're trying to make a run back at the UFC. You know, everyone wants to be in the big leagues. I want to be back in the big leagues. and Or strike force. I mean, obviously now throwing underneath one umbrella. Um, I'd love to beat the 185-pound division either way class. You know, and, and no, I'm not saying, hey, I'm, you know, I'll be the guy to beat Anderson Silva. I'll be the guy to go and, you know, challenge, you know, challenge uh, for, the, for the title at strike force. Not gonna ha and, like, I'm not saying that. I'm saying I would like to be back in the big leagues. And hopefully I can get a couple wins in my belt and, and then get the UFC to bring me back in. Or strike force to bring me in. Well, that's a, this is definitely a, a, a good test for you, and that's uh, pretty impressive. Uh, you're not 22 year, uh, years old anymore, and uh, we're not going to expose how old it is, but that's, uh, that's <laughs> it's, uh, it's impressive. You're going in there, and, and you're taking on a tough opponent. So you, you're serious. You, you want to get back into the UFC again. That's that's the goal? Yeah, that was the whole game plan. You know, it was really is because is ultimately I want to be a commentator when I, when, I, when I retire from the sport. Who doesn't want to be a commentator in some aspect or some fashion? So you're trying to take my job away from me, is that what you're well, saying? Not your job. I, I wanna, you know, I, but I definitely like to work underneath the Zufo umbrella. I mean, that's, that's the goal and the, the amazement is to be in there. Um, the also the goal is amazing that when I retire and when I go out, like Randy Couture is going out on his on his own his own merits when he wants to choose to go out. When I choose to go out, I want to be able to do it where I can go. You know, it's time for me to go out, but I'm at, I'm I'm here with the big leagues. I'm here with the big guys. I'm here with all the best guys, and I'm I'm honestly challenging myself every time that I fight. And there's no there's no more easy fights anymore in, in, over there. There's no there's no oh, this guy's not ranked in the top ten. I don't care, man. Everybody over there is two or three fights away from being in the title hunt in any weight class, whoever you are at those weight classes. So it's like every guy you fight, he's two or three fights away from the title hunt. That's a that's a dangerous guy. So I want to. 
you know, we're going to compete and compete with the best, compete against the best, find out where you're going to be at and find out where my range is at. You know, and, and I am the old guy now. I'm turning 39 in a couple of weeks. So it's like I am the old guy. You know, and that's the way, it, that's the, just the reality of it is. But in the last eight months, I've actually gotten better than I have in the last 10 years because of just going, instead of, instead of following Randy around the country, I started stepping in his footsteps and going, okay, well, let me stop and think about my train camp before I put the train camp together. Let me pick the guys that I want to have in my train camp and spar with. Let me go, no, let me just grab some guy, oh, you're the next guy next to me, so let me grab you. No, let me grab the guys that mimic the style. Let me ask these guys, please show up for practice on time. Let me pay certain guys to come in and be there for me when I need them to be there every Tuesday, every Thursday, so I can kick him in the head and punch him in the head. You know, and it makes a, it makes a big difference in train camp. You get a little bit sore, you're a little bit more tired when you go home, but you have a lot more satisfaction because you know that you put in a, a good day's worth of work, and every day is a good day's worth of work and makes it much better when it's time for the actual fight to happen. And uh, I realized that in, in Israel you got Tim Lane, Tim Bring the Pain Lane, uh, who uh, as your striking coach, and yeah. I, I noticed it. I saw the difference, and and, and I, I'm pretty sure Roy Neiman uh, felt the difference. Uh, you, your striking, I, I have to say, is better than ever. Well, you know, the, the, Tim is a true left-hander. He's not a right-handed coach trying to teach a left-hander how to box. He's a real, true left-handed Muay Thai guy, and I'm a true left-handed guy. There's very few of us in the world. So for Tim and I to even to meet is, is a probability of 1 in 50, for us to even to meet each other, but then for us to be able to train each other is like a probability of 1 in 1,000. I mean, it's, it's amazing the probability of us being able to train together. And so now we're going, hey, look, you know, you're a lefty coach, former competitor, I'm a lefty competitor, teach me how to be a left-handed guy. The whole game is opened up. It's a totally different ball game. I'm not learning from a right-handed guy. What you know, the, what you have to do is a straight, you know, by the way, I, everyone says against a lefty, you have to throw the straight right. That's the biggest thing is you throw these straight lefts against a righty, a, a lefty or righty will throw against a lefty, a straight right. That's the game. That's not the game. That's why Pacquiao is so good because he doesn't play that game. Everybody thinks that's what you have to do. It's the biggest thing. That's the biggest thing. That's not the biggest thing. Tim figured it out. Obviously, Roach, Freddie Roach figured it out with Pacquiao. There's a secret that people aren't paying attention to. It's not really a secret because you see him do it every time he fights. But there's something in there that you're not paying attention to that, that lefties actually do against righties. It changed my philosophy. It changed my mindset. Now when I get to actually add my kicks in and my knees in, on top of that, it actually does make my hands better. And, and now I've learned how to not to make every punch a freaking power punch and go out there and try to kill a guy with every punch. Four or five of my punches, you only get hit hard with two of them. The other three are punches to set up the other two. You know, in, in, in the pattern, it's going to knock you out, so it takes a lot less energy to do what I'm doing. And so it makes my punching better because I'm not like, Ugh! and you got exhausted all of a sudden. You're just like, oh, wow, I just threw 15 punches, but only two of them really mattered, so who cares? You know, you kind of move on. So it's good. It's, it, Tim's really opened up my eyes to how to be a real striker. Uh, I've had the luxury to work with Tim as well. He's a great coach and obviously a great competitor when he was competing, so he's getting old too, though. But, uh, but you're talking about being a commentator after done. You, fighting is not the only thing you're doing right now. You have a couple of side ventures as well. What else do you do? Yeah, I do. A, I have a couple of websites and, and a couple of things that are, that are about to break. I can't really announce them yet, but I got a couple of things in the next two or three months are going to snap out. They're going to be, I mean, they're not going to be game changers or anything like that, but they're definitely going to be different things differently within the MMA world that people haven't done before that I'm going to kind of bring to the table. One of the things I am doing pretty heavily is I work for HDNet, which is uh, the guy that owns the Dallas Mavericks, uh, Mark Cuban, owns a owns a television station called HCNet, and it every pretty much every fight that's not um, the UFC or Strike Force is seen on HCNet. That's pretty much where all the other fights go, uh, and I get had the privilege of, of being able to commentate all of them with Michael the Voice Chevello, uh, the Australian ca character, and we get down and dirty every time. It's a different kind of commentating team because they brought me in to be the in-your-face, no-holds-barred kind of commentator where I'm like, you know, I've, I've called out, like Bobby Lashley, I called him out and said, great athlete, amazing, amazing guy. You know, came out the same time that Brock Lesnar did, had the, the amateur background in wrestling, had the, the professional background in wrestling, and then went on and became a professional MMA fighter. And Lesnar became the heavyweight champ, and Lashley's kind of faltered around. We thought he had a shot to be, like, one of the best guys, and he just cardiovascular-wise, he's just not ready to go. And I made a big deal about it because he just, he's got all the talent in the world, all the skill in the world, great guy, but just doesn't have a cardiovascular and can't finish guys. And so as a result, he's not ready for the big time. And, you know, I call, like, guys, my friends, like Phil Baroni, he's one of my, one of my closest friends, and whenever he, he's on one of the cards I'm calling, I call him out. Like, this is, like, you just didn't do what you need to do to get ready for this fight, or you did. You know, I'm not scared to, to give him praise as well, but that's kind of why they hired me. And then, and the voice is, if you haven't heard of the voice, call a fight, and you, you're missing something special. He's got more one-liners than you can ever imagine. He, he finally pulled one the other day that had me just live on the air. I'm just laughing. I can't stop. I can't stop. Like, I've broken down the broadcast because he's like, he's getting, uh, this guy's getting hit more often than a Facebook picture. I'm like, this, this, it just threw me off. Like, I, I didn't know what to do at that point. I just started laughing. I just had to stop. Like, I was just, I had to shut my mic off and get walk away from the table. So, he's really good. It's really fun to be to work with him, so I'm pretty blessed too because Andrew Simon, you know, and, and Guy Metzger over at HDNet said, you know, let's give Trick a chance when I when I got released in the UFC after the Sarah fight, and so let's see what he can do. And they've kept me around for over a year now, and you know, hopefully they'll you know keep me around for a little bit longer.
Yeah, for you that don't know, Frank Trigg just normally pull in punches. When he has something to say, he has something to say. Well, there you have it. Frank Trigg is, is legitimately back and wants to uh, uh, go for a run in the UFC again. Uh, fighting on what date was in May? Uh, we're fighting uh, May 21st in uh, Bama, British Association of Mixed Martial Arts uh, at uh, Wembley Stadium in London, England. Wembley Stadium. You know it doesn't get any bigger than that, right? Wembley Stadium. I, I didn't know until you told me. No, I had no idea. Thanks. I'm not nervous at all already going over there. Now you're going to make it worse for me? Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, so, are you coming in wearing a Manchester United shirt, I hope? Um, had, you know what? I hadn't thought about that. Actually, I hadn't thought about that at all. I thought about coming in wearing, wearing, a, um, uh, wearing a Canadian flag. That's what I thought I was going to do. No, I don't know what I'm going to do. I haven't, actually, I haven't thought that far ahead. I'm not a planner like that. Like, I don't know. Manchester United? Maybe. You know, maybe. I, I like them. I mean, they're all right. If you really want to hear the crowd go nuts, put on a French flag or a German flag. That would, that would go down well. I, actually, I thought, about wearing the, I thought about wearing a French flag because, you know, even the French don't like the French. I mean, it's, it's one of those things. It's kind of weird. You know, got good food and good wine, but not much else. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. They don't pick on me. Yeah, I'm sure we've got some French fans out there as well. Um, May 21st in uh, London, Wembley Arena, Bama, Frank Trigg. Thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>